So I like to read some things out of the book, not because I don't know it, but so that you won't think I'm making it up. Because some things that we share, not here for this sangha, but uh, away, there are uh, people like, like, where'd you get that from? Because I've never heard that before. Um, and then they give me a reference from some contemporary teacher's book, you know, that says this or it says that, you know. And so I tell them where, where I, where we get it from. So I mean, I think that whoever this public wisdom, wisdom should really cut us a check because we have been responsible for a lot of purchases of this book. <laughs> it's kind of like a. Uh, the manufacturer who makes Prius should send us a Prius too. Uh, because we have made the Prius famous. Uh, that's the analogy we mo use for uh, once we have control of the mind. You know, it's like pulling up to that stop sign and just powering down. That That's it. You know, and that's all we're practicing to be able to do, to just power down, shut off the discursive thinking. Like, we need it sometimes. You know, if I'm deciding whether to walk across, uh, navigate across a highway or not, you know, like, I don't want to be in Jono at that time. I want to be able to, like, use my uh, critical thinking skills and, you know, and and the faculties for navigating, crossing crossing that street. But when we're approaching um, uh, meditation, then we need to be able to suspend that. And in doing so, we posit ourselves at the doorway of the unknown, that which we don't know, and we make it possible that we might apprehend something. Um, and the only caveat is that we don't tie it to something we already know and say, oh, this is this. So that's what happens a lot. And it's not that we have not had an authentic experience or we haven't had a direct insight, but because we have not suspended you know, our conceptual thinking, then when we come upon it, we tie it to something um, we, we tie it to the wrong experience or we perceive it in a certain way instead of uh, uh, it informing us, we, we apply a definition or an appearance to it. So the thing about meditation is that it, al it, it allows the um, altering of the structure of appearances how things appear to us, how we know them. Not, not really about what we know, but how we know, how we know things. And that's, um, and that's the difference. So I was trying to decide which one of these three things <laughs> I thought would be useful for us right where we are between uh, Sutta number Ten on the foundations of mindfulness and Sutta 62, the continuing instruction uh, that the Buddha gave to his son Rahula. And I think I will continue with that because uh, those two things, because we were making good progress. I do want to touch on uh, temperament sometime today because he says that one should know one's temperament, because then you know how to make the approach. The approach is made according to uh, the, 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 the your temperament, the your, uh, your ways of seeing things and your ways of understanding things. And so as anyone who doesn't know the, the six basic temperaments as explained uh, in the Vasudhi Magas. Anybody not know? Okay, well, let's just go there first. <laughs> and so in the 
Paths of Purification, that's a Fasuti Manga, the taking of a meditation subject, and it tells you how you should take up a meditation subject. And um, and if you don't have one that through re- rebirth linking consciousness you have an affinity with, you know, then he suggests that you uh, can always do mindfulness of breathing because uh, that that object is always with you and it, it fulfills uh, all the requirements of the four foundations of, of mindfulness. And so all your bases are covered, in other words, uh, focusing uh, on, the, on the breath. And it's generally why we always use the breath, because it's one that's universally suitable for every type of temperament. But <coughs> they say, and when I say they say, <laughs> that means that we can't see anywhere definitely uh, the Buddha had this kind of Dhamma talk. You know, because you know, like we have Dhamma talks, but he didn't really have Dhamma talk. He was just like wrapping mind, and he began to speak to each person like what they need to hear to make the next step. And we have now just compiled them into talks or, di- or discourses. Uh, so it's always good to develop the kind of presence that you can kind of, of the kind of grokking that lets you know what a person needs to hear. And we do that on, on it. You know, it's like, oh, that's woo-woo, mind-wrapping mind. But we do that on a very, na- uh, uh, on everyday uh, basis as well. It's like like when you s- uh, recognize that someone is distressed and this is the way to calm them down. This is the way to talk to them. This is the way, you know. And we have this capacity already. You know, this is just a heightening of it, a, a refining, a refining of a very natural capacity that we have on our level given our classification of being, you see. And that's why the, the Buddha talks about these things. He doesn't talk about them being supernatural powers, but supernormal, uh, just bumping up our natural, ordinary capacity. And, uh, and that being informed and that wisdom making it super or more than ordinary. That's it, that's it, that's it, you know? So we don't have to be uh, afraid of these things or think there's something that, that that's not attainable. It's more like uh, just uh, conditioning the muscles to be able to lift the weight, you know? So con- conditioning our mental faculties to be able um, for them to be of, uh, be it operating at full ca- at full capacity, um, and you will find that when that happens, uh, you can always know where that space is. It's supra in the sense that it's beyond, uh, also beyond our ordinary uh, realm of of conditioning, and by that I mean you can be in a particular state. And you can still catapult to that space where that wisdom lies, and you can and you can pull it out and 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 utilize it. And so, part of of uh, like training that when you drop into a space of sil- stillness, where you're uh, where you're like uh, retiring or s- or uh, your own ways of organizing data uh, becomes more relaxed. Um, you'll find this space where the knowledge sits, and you can actually access it. And when you know where that space is, so the Buddha says, practice going in and coming out the stillness, in and going out the stillness. We call it, it's in the stillness, you know, but practicing going in and out and in and out so that anytime you need to access, information beyond what your ordinary five sense senses is telling you, then you can like just go right there. You can go right there. And so when we practice meditation, once we have found or touched or apprehended, approached and entered the stillness, then we come out. He said, come out. 
and then now go right back in to make sure you know exactly um, how to establish it in front of you. You know exactly where it is. Um, and this takes and this takes practice, and that's the difference between having you know like um, you know sometimes like you just drop into a state you don't know how you got there you don't know where it is or like, like we're just enjoying it. Um, uh, sometimes we even have experiences that nobody's uh, like uh, talked about, and we think it was just this fluke thing we had, and then you learn about that being a state. And a uh, uh, um, uh, an attainment on the path. You're like, oh, ten years ago. You know, I was like just sitting there, and I had this experience. Just like the Buddha did the same thing. He's sitting here struggling, struggling, trying to awaken. You know, and he's flagellating himself. He's down to one grain of rice a day, and and you know, he's doing all these things. And he said, I'm sitting here, you know, and I'm, and I'm almost dead. And uh, this maiden comes by and she gives me some rice milk and it saves my life. And then like like here, I am start to think, like maybe this is not the path, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, he said, I had already been at the other extreme, you know, like of however good your world could be in 500 B.C. Um, that's what he had. And he said, uh, that wasn't. The way that didn't bring me any lasting peace and happiness. So, so I go to the opposite end. That 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 wasn't it either, you know. And and he said, and then his mind went back to when he was a, a young child, a, a baby, you know. And he was like sitting on the blanket up underneath the tree, and and while the workers were gleaning in the fields, and he had this experience. I would dare say that many of us have had experiences in this life when we were children that if we were to relax enough, set aside our our extraordinary faculties of reasoning enough to just touch what occurred naturally, we could make more progress than using all of our intellect to struggle to try to get into some state because you can't get into it that way. Um, We have to, like, uh, expend effort to stop efforting. It's something like that. Um, So, yes, there is effort that is required. Yes, we do arouse something, but it's mostly laboring to enter into the rest that is available. That's the hard thing, laboring to enter into the rest. So he said it's good, or they say, meaning um, the patriarchs of old, um, who were trying to help those of us who couldn't get it with a few words, you know, and so they started expanding, breaking it down, breaking it down. You know, that's why I tell you that, that you know, less is more. You know, the Buddha gives you, bang, two words. You know, you can't get in two, he give you ten. You can't give it in ten, then he give you a whole discourse. You can't get it in a discourse, you know, then he'll do the army dollar and just start breaking it down, breaking it down, analyzing it, you know, so... So some of us need a, like a full analytical exposition. Some of us just need a couple of words, you know. And so he he covers the whole spectrum. You can have a little or a lot in this room. Some need a little, some need a lot. Some can feel into it, and some it has to make sense to their head before it can drop into the heart. And there's nothing wrong with either one. That's just the different propensities of of people, of of human beings. Um, and so it's good to try to cover the spectrum to make sure that everybody's <laughs> included. So uh, they talk about these six types of personality or uh, temperament, uh, the kinds of states that are continually occurring in your mind. It says there's one of a 
uh, understanding temperament or uh, one of a hating temperament, uh, one of a, a faithful temperament, one of a greedy temperament, one of a speculative temperament, and one of a delusional temperament. And then he says, of these six kinds, there are three pairs. So the uh, hating and understanding, one pair. Faithful and the greedy, one pair. Delusional and speculative, one pair. And we think of understanding versus hating temperament as being like 180 degrees apart, two, uh, two opposite poles. He says, no, actually, you're more like this. <laughs> Very close together. You think, um, you know, you don't have that much work to do. That's what's so wonderful about, you know, having a little bit of wisdom so that, and it's one thing that helps us to acknowledge, uh, you know, like what we are. Like if we're in a hating mode, we can acknowledge that we're in a hating mode. We don't have to say, oh, like I'm not a hater. I love, I love everybody. There was a woman, and she was, uh, she was the chiefest busybody, of, you know, in our whole group. But she was the one who could not recognize at all that she was a busybody, you know. And so if you had a talk about busybody-ness, busybody-ness, uh, she would be the first one to say, I, um, I am so glad I, don't, I am not like that, <laughs> you know. And everybody would be looking at each other because nobody was going to look at her. <laughs> and it was, it was really funny. So a lot of times we have these propensities and, and we actually have no clue or we just cannot acknowledge it to ourselves, you know. And so um, he makes it easy for us to acknowledge things, you know. That's how he shows you how to wash away guilt and how to wash away shame. Now, you have to do the washing, but he shows how easy it is to wash it away simply by how you take it, detach it from yourself. He says, it's not you, it's not yours, it's not even worthy to be called myself. And so he talks about how closely aligned the one of a hating temperament is with one of an understanding temperament. He says, because the one who hates condemns living beings. But the one who understands condemns the mental formations, the, the thoughts that are not skillful, not beneficial, not useful, that are destructive. And he separates the person from the thoughts, from the ignorance. So ignorance is the culprit not the person. Ignorance is the enemy, not the person. And when we can begin to make that slight transfer, then hatred dissolves. It falls away. And when that impediment is removed, we see ourselves as the lovers that we are. So the effort is just simply to move the object. That's why training in meditation is so important. Being able to capture, to, uh, to grok with an object and to be able to hold your concentration and move the mind at will. Move the mind at will. And to be able to establish a willingness to you know, I mean, because most of this you have to really be willing. You say, like, yeah, I want to, you know, but do you really want it? You know, I'm, are you willing in the moment when you're heading in this direction to pull yourself back and just stop? You know, like knowing, okay, I'm knowing I'm, I know I'm going too far, but I just got to get this one last thing I want to say about it. You know, you know, just this one last thing, and then I'm through. Then I'm not going to say anything else about it, you know. 
So it's right, in, it's in that moment. This training is about, uh, about uh, conjuring up the willingness to just stop. And then we come back and we say, well, like I didn't know, you know, like I, I just said, I don't know. But it is becoming, establishing mindfulness in front of ourselves and having, developing the willingness to just stop. When we know that we're heading in a direction that is not going to be beneficial, that we're going to have to come back and apologize for, or that we, you know, we really don't want to go down that road, but we not quite up to doing the work, the efforting to stop. So, so meditation is designed to help us to develop that, you know, and to remove ourselves from the infraction so that we don't flagellate ourselves and don't blame ourselves. Those two things. And then there is no remorse. When we do the morning chant, we talk about the, vir the value of virtue is that it removes the affliction of remorse. And one impediment of remorse is that we start not having enough confidence in ourselves that we can do the right thing at the right time. And so this is all designed, if you see, to build up our, our esteem. I mean, in a healthy, a healthy self-esteem, in a healthy way, in a useful way, in a kind and compassionate way towards ourselves. And then, of course, we can offer what we have for ourselves when it is full to overflowing. Then it just drops on other people. We don't even try. We don't have to try being kind. <laughs> we just are just kind. Now, kindness is not always like that sickly sweetness, you know. You know that. You know what I'm talking about. But we can be, we can be direct, and and there be no cruelty in it. We can be direct, and there's nothing else that goes with it. You know, no smoldering flame. No. Let me stick it to her. No getting back. No, just, oh, hmm, stop. That's it. No judgment about it. You know, nothing imputed on the individual. That's what I'm trying to say. Nothing imputed on the individual. And so we leave not intending any harm. And the one who's on the recipient end can gladly receive, you know, assistance, some direction or some instruction without feeling like they have been, you know, accosted. That's our work on both sides. You know, we become mature, we can give it, we can take it, because it's not personal. If we really don't make it personal. <laughs> you know, some people, they do all kinds of stuff, and then they say, like, you know, this is not personal. Uh -huh, I don't mean like that. I mean, like, really, truly. <laughs> and sometimes we don't make it quite right, but we're all in training, so we know, you know, that we're in a safe yeah. space. So we're we all in training to do this, yeah. So that little switch, just from uh, from having, <coughs> from blaming, from hating the person, to just seeing the destructiveness of ignorance and not the person. So if you constantly have thoughts, you know, that put you in the hating category, then you know that I'm of a hating temperament. That's all. Okay, excuse me, because I have on jammies under here. And 
Is this being recorded? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> it's all right with me. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, um, well, 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 in their diagnosis, what did they tell you? That you don't like to be around people or you don't? I'm scared of stuff. Okay. So I wouldn't say that that's the same thing. No. <laughs> uh, so, well, let me finish and, and you'll see if you can fit find yourself. Okay. But a hating temperament is one who's always k thinking thoughts of anger and ill will and and I, I, I've known you for a long time. That's not you. So, so in that, in, no. Can't accept that one. Okay. So, but it, who constantly thinking thoughts of of ill will and uh, anger, you know, um, and what goes along with that, like um, uh, and and uh, judgment, judging people, and uh you know being critical criticizing um you know that like that so you just have this little switch this little shift to make it's not 180 degrees that's the good news for the hater you know that's the good news that you don't have to turn it go 180 degrees. Yeah. So you have the faithful and the um, greedy. And those of a greedy temperament like things. They're always looking. They like fine things. Uh, they like expensive things. They like, you know, uh, and things have to be just so for them and it doesn't mean necessarily that they are like uh can satisfy their greed you know like it doesn't mean like they're always wealthy you can be poor and have a greedy temperament you don't have to have a dime you don't just love money it doesn't mean you have to have any you know uh but in the things that money can buy and and uh there's this this um kind of of desire f for pompousness and on a great show, and uh, their eyes are always just being captured about by uh, fine things, expensive things, nice things, beautiful things. One of a faithful temperament is inspired and captivated by those who have or appear to have good qualities. Know. And so while one of a greedy temperament has a greed for things, one of a faithful temperament, you know, has a greed for goodness and good qualities. And there's a danger in that because uh, you only want to see that. You don't want to recognize things as they are, so you tag around behind uh, who's the big name or who's the, you know, or even someone who does have wonderful, wonderful qualities. But you, uh, you refuse to see any uh, modes of being that don't, in them that don't line up to your fantasy about their perfection, you know. And so, um, so I look, I, I watch out for ones of a faithful temperament. If I recognize they have a faithful temperament, then I put a little distance between us. 
and I do it rightfully so because I'm far from perfect and uh, that's a one that it would be a danger to you know so out of protection from them you know uh, an astute you know uh, a compassionate teacher puts a little bit of space now some others like just use that you know they just they just they like lean right in on that um, but one should be uh, mindful of how you can injure someone who has such a uh, on one hand it it is such a, a wonderful aspiration, such a tender heart, such a reaching for for goodness, but it's in a somewhat unbalanced way, you know. So then, when reality strikes about how something is, like it's hard, they they can't take it. It's hard to take. Mm. So while one has a mode for things grasping for things the other has uh, a mode and an interest around embellishing good virtues yeah so they're not like this they're like this and it's just a matter the one who is greedy beginning to um, meditate and reflect